Hello and welcome to Griffin Art and today I'd like to share with you this fairly large pyramid shaped box which I've specifically designed to take a number of Ferrero Rocher chocolates. Now as always I do like to introduce you a little to the box before we get creative just so that you can make sure that it's actually a project that's for you. So in the first instance we've got lots of layers of card on the outside of our box and that helps to make it really sturdy. We've also got some thick layers of card sections on the base of our box cover which have been designed to be concealed on the outside of the box but are actually forming the closing flaps for our box. So at this point we're now able to remove our box cover and reveal our Ferrero Rocher chocolate. Now I have got a Christmas version of this box to show you at the end of this tutorial but as you can see I've stuck with a pyramid theme here and I will be showing you how to achieve this look if that's something that you want to be doing. Now I promise you that I haven't just eaten all of those Ferrero Rocher as tempting as that might be but I have removed them just so that I could show you these trays as well. So we've simply got three trays here which have been graduated in size and they're supported each by a pillar that is the maximum size that it could be in order to support the tray above it. And just to keep everything coordinated, the pillars have also received the same sort of treatment as the rest of the inside of the box. Right, so I hope that that's enough information for you to start with. I can now set everything up so that we can get on with the project. Now the first component that we're going to address is that thick base section. And that's because we are needing to layer card that's going to take a lot of glue and that needs time to dry out. So it's best to get that out of the way first. Now the base of our box is actually seven and a half inches square so I'm starting out with a piece of card that is that size and the first thing that I'm going to do is to find the centre of that square and I'm going to do that by drawing a line diagonally across the points of the card and I'm, I've actually positioned it on my self heel mat here so I can more clearly see where those corners are positioned just by lining them up on the line on my self heel mat. So I'm going to just do the other corners. And that's giving me the central position here for my piece of card. Incidentally, for those of you who are not used to my videos, you, I should make you aware that there is a PDF document to accompany this tutorial. So there's no need for you to make any notes at all. You've got all your card sizes. Everything is um, in order that you need to approach this project. So you just follow it through. You've got um, comprehensive instructions and you've got several diagrams. So that document is available for download from my website at griffinart.co.uk. I will put a link for you in the description area for this video. So if you are a really experienced box maker, you can probably just go straight to this document and get on with the project. So, so that's there for you. Right, so returning to my card component, my seven and a half inch square of card that I found the center in, the next thing that I'm going to do is to punch a 10 millimeter hole in the center of that card. And I do want to explain this to you at this point because it's one of those things that is optional and you may decide that you're just not going to bother with this. So then, in order to provide some strength to these pillar components, bearing in mind that people are going to be reaching in here and potentially knocking against the edge of the tray, perhaps pushing against these pillars, I didn't want them being dislodged off their trays. And so they're actually held in place with a Chicago screw, or you may know them as a bookbinder's binding post. Now they're simply a two part component. So you've just got two parts. One of them has just got a, um, a threaded part to it on the inside. The other has a screw head attached to it and the two can be screwed together to contain 
certainly layers of card in this case. So you just screw them up tight and you've got this little gap in between and then you've got the screw head that you know you can use to tighten things up with. Now you, you know you might consider this over the top and in an actual fact there is a potentially enough surface area on the base of this pillar here that you even I might consider that I could have got away without using that Chicago screw for this particular larger pillar. But I, you know, I am happier that I have used it for the smaller pillar here at the top. Obviously, I'll leave it up to you whether you choose to use that component, but if you do, you definitely need to be punching holes as I'm going to be doing in a moment. Now, taking into consideration the fact that card thicknesses vary, and so do components, so you may not actually be buying the same manufacturer of Chicago screw as I have got. There are a couple of things that you probably need to do for this project just to double check that everything's going to go together well. The first thing was to ascertain how many pieces of card were going to fit inside that screw to give me a nice tight fit. And you can just take a series of pieces of card and keep adding them in until you know that you've got a tight fit. And in this case, with my card, I know that in between this gap here, I require six layers of card. That's what that will take there. Now, the other thing that we need to bear in mind is the fact that you can see that there is quite a thickness to this screw head. And in actual fact, there is even a slight dome to that head. And there are instances where you don't want that dome to be in the way so you need to recess it into the card and this is where those 10 millimeter holes start to come into play if I take this piece here which is a six millimeter hole you can see that that's protruding and if I try to cover that with another piece of card the card on top is not going to lay flat so in order to recess that screw head we need to know how many thicknesses of card actually would allow for that to be recessed. So all you need to do there is lay that screw down on a flat surface and hold it down tight and keep building up the layers of card until they start to go over the top of the side of that screw head. And that's going to give you the figure that you're looking for. Now for the thickness of card that I'm using, which is around 300 GSM thick, then I know that that requires four pieces of card to cover that screw head. So as long as you've got that same scenario going on with your own components, assuming you want to use this Chicago screw option, so that's four thicknesses of card to recess the head of the screw and six pieces of card to fit within the Chicago screw, then you've got exactly the same scenario as I have set up for the PDF instructions and as I will be following through with in this tutorial. So you can just go ahead and, and take the same approach without any adjustments. Right, so with that explained, the first thing that I'm going to be doing is to start to create that recess space for that Chicago screw head. And because that Chicago screw head is 10 millimeters in diameter, I'm going to be punching a 10 millimeter hole in the center of my base component. Now, in order to do that, I am actually using a 10 millimeter punch that is designed for leather work, really. And you can get hold of these off eBay. Now, I've got a separate little anvil that came with something else, but you can probably cut, use this directly onto a self-heal mat as well. So I, I will just do that. So I would place my card on my anvil, my punch, and apply a, a hammer, And that, assuming that's my component. Now, if you haven't got a round punch, don't worry. You're only just trying to provide a hole for that screw head to fit into. So, you know, you could take a scalpel blade or a craft knife and just cut a small square that's 10 millimeter in diameter. I know you're gonna end up with a little gap in the corners, but it's fine. You will have the same end result. Now, just as a hint, what I find when I'm using those um, 
punches, those leather punches, is that actually to, to find the center, it's easier to bring the component up to you and use a scrap piece of card that you've already punched a 10 millimeter hole in. Then you can place it and see where those lines intersect. And it's much easier, I've found, to find that central position with this piece of card by just using those um, those diagonal lines in the center. Once you've ascertained that, then I find that the punch locates itself a lot more easily. So I'm now ready to punch up with my hammer to create the hole. I will do that off camera because it makes a lot of noise and you know, I think you can get the gist of what's needing to be done there. Right, so that 10 millimeter hole has now been punched into the center there. And you can see that my Chicago screw head passes through the, right through the middle there. So mission accomplished. So the next thing that I need to do is start to build up the layers of card because A, that screw head needs to be recessed as we've mentioned just now, but also this is clearly way too flimsy for our box base and we need to strengthen it. So in order to do that, you could simply cut another piece of card, seven and a half inches square and glue it that way. Or as I prefer to do, I just take another piece of card that's larger than my component and I will glue that in place so that I can easily line it up on one edge and then cut around it. So I will do one on camera just to show you what's going on. So I want to keep this reference. I need that to be visible because I'm going to be using it later on in the project. So you always want to keep these diagonal lines, pencil lines visible. So I'm going to be applying glue to the other side of the card. I'm just going to be using PVA glue and I'm going to use a lot of it. You know, what glue you decide to use is absolutely up to you. I, I'm no expert on glues at all. But what I do find with PVA glue is that I do like to get a good coverage so that the whole of the card is actually coated. And that allows me to slide the components around together. But it also means that it allows me to get rid of any bubbles. Oops, didn't really want to do that. Um, get rid of any bubbles that might otherwise occur in in between the card layers. So I'll just continue off camera and get this covered with glue because it's going to take a bit of time and then I'll come back to you at the point that I'm going to glue the two pieces together. Right, so I'm hoping that you can see I've got lots of glue on there a good coverage and it's all curled over because it adds moisture to the cards and, and that's actually the result. So the next thing I'm going to do is not bother too much about anything other than one edge because um, it can be quite difficult. This is why I now choose, having you know done a few of these, to put this size component on a completely fresh piece of card because it means I only have to worry about lining up one edge and even if I get that slightly wrong I can trim that back as well it's giving me scope for error which you know is not unheard of when I'm working I'm afraid so at this point I can bring in my trusty bone folder and start to apply pressure and some of that glue will start to ooze and I'm just going to get rid of it as, as much as I can it's not that important for me at this stage to keep all my components clean because I'm going to be applying a paint finish anyway um, but also this is the base and it will be getting covered up in the main so um, you know let evidence of glue is going to be obliterated really later on in the project so I'm not too concerned at this stage I'd rather get this component well and truly stuck down. So I'm now going to just pop that under a weight just to give it time to dry out and at that point then I can come back and I will punch another hole in it. Right so that's now had a little bit of time just to go off. So the next thing that I'm going to do and this time I won't need to use my little um, scrap piece of card because I've already got the center position for my punch. So I will just use that position there to punch through another 10 millimeter hole through the 
through the new layer of card and then I'll just use a craft knife to cut around the edge of the card and remove any excess that's not wanted. So I'll do that off camera because it's quite straightforward and I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so that's my component, seven and a half inch square base. It's now two layers of card thick and it's got a 10 millimeter hole in the center. Now, my first target is to build that up to three layers of card thick. So I'm just going to repeat that same process again. So apply glue to the back here so that I can still keep my pencil marks visible and apply that to another layer of card punch my hole and cut off the excess. So you, you, you understand that aspect now. I'll do that off camera and come back to you at that point. Right, so that's my component now three layers of card thick with my 10 millimeter hole in the center. But I need one more layer in order to recess that screw head if you remember. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to take a small piece of card that's actually three and a half inches square just to go in the center here and this time we're going to glue it onto the side where those pencil marks are this is actually the base this is it's going to sit this way down when the um, base is finished so the, the pencil lines will be going um, on the on the surface so in order to line these up I'm, and I'll explain why it's just a small square in a minute, but I'm just going to glue this in place so that each corner on this little square sits on one of these pencil lines and then I know that it's placed centrally. So I will glue that off camera and once it's glued in place, you'll be able to see here that I've still got access to my hole so I can then punch that 10 millimeter hole in as well. So I'll do both those things off camera and then I will come back to you. Okay, so that's now also glued in place and I've repeated that 10 millimeter hole again. Now I did just want to explain why this is a small piece of card rather than another seven and a half inch piece. And that's basically because when we come to join these flaps, they are going to take up this space around the edge so that we're going to get a good strong join. We're going to have a quite a large amount of card from these flaps going onto the base and that's going to secure them well. So that's why we've left some space around the edge here. Now I am going to do a very similar process again. So I need another layer thickness of card, but this time I want to start to retain my Chicago screw. So instead of punching a 10 millimeter hole in the middle, I'm going to use a smaller six millimeter punch and that will get punched in the center there and that will start to retain my Chicago screw. So again, I'm just going to glue the back of this. So keep the pencil marks visible again, apply that to the side there and punch that six millimeter hole centrally. So I'll do that off camera. Now, before I do go off camera, I just want to make you aware that this now is our final piece of card on this top surface. So if you are not applying a paint finish to this, this is going to be your decorative side of your base. So it's equivalent to this area here. So if you're not painting it, you might just want to take a little extra care not to get any glue on this surface. So that's just a hint for you. So I'll be back with you in a second. Right, so that's my component. So this is now five layers of card thick in this central area where this small square is. You can see that on that final layer, on this back layer, I've just got a hole that is six millimeters thick. Now what that means is that my Chicago screw head is definitely going to be recessed, and but it's going to hold in place because it can't go through that six millimeter hole. So the only thing now, you can probably see that it has a tendency to curve, it's very moist still at the moment, so I need to put that under a weight to dry. Now, the only thing is here that I've got an extra level of card here. So before I put that under a weight, I need to bring that level. So I'm simply going to use some scrap pieces of card all the way around. You don't have to join exactly, as long as you can bring that level back and then put a weight on top and leave that 
to thoroughly dry out. So I'm going to do that and then I can come back to you at that point. Right, so now that I'm happy that that component is going to dry nice and flat, I can start to turn my attention to other aspects of this project. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to create a triangular template and that's because it's going to make life so much easier moving forward and so I think it's actually worth taking the time to do. So I'm starting out with just a scrap piece of card and that's seven and a quarter inches by six and a half inches and I've simply placed it here to start with in landscape mode. Now the first thing that I need to do is to find the halfway point within this piece of card. So landscape mode means this is seven and a quarter inches from right to left and that means that the midway point is going to be three and five eighths of an inch. Now I have used my uh, the grid on my self heel mat just to square everything up and as this line edge here is on the five inch line I can add that three and five eighths of an inch so I'm going to be working at eight and five eighths of an inch to find that line. So if I just pop that on and I can make sure that my pencil will actually be on that uh, five eighths of an inch marker. And as long as everything's square on my grid, I can simply draw that line straight across that card. And that's giving me my starting point. Now at this point, I'm just going to turn my card to portrait mode so that I can draw another set of lines. Now in this particular instance, I'll probably do this off camera because I need to make sure that they're fairly accurate. But we're just drawing straight across the card again and the measurements are going to be at one and seven eighths of an inch, so right across the card. Then it'll be just a quarter of an inch on, so two and one eighths of an inch and a second line and then at four inches. So that'll be the last line. So I'll do that off camera and come back to you and show you the result. Okay, so that's my pattern piece so far. I've got a central pencil line there and then I've got these dissecting pencil lines that are located at one and seven eighths of an inch, at two and one eighths of an inch, and at four inches. So at this point, I'm going to turn my pattern piece clockwise back to landscape mode so that I've got that small one and seven eighths of an inch panel section across the top of the card. Now at this point I can start to form an equilateral triangle and I'm simply going to do that by utilizing that central position line and I'm going to draw a line from that center through to this bottom left hand, no right hand corner in this case so just draw that central line and then do the same to this other side here. So that I'm forming an equilateral triangle. So we've got this triangle here. So I can now trim these sections off this angle piece here and this piece here because they are excess pieces of card that I don't require. So I'll do that off camera and come back at that point. Right, so that's my equilateral triangle template now ready to go. The only other thing that I've done here is I've labeled up those lines. So line one, line two, and line three. And that's just going to bring that in line with the PDF document of instructions that I've provided for you. And it will just give it a little bit more clarity. So now that that's sorted, we can set that to one side until we're ready to use it. And we can start to get on with our main box cover. Right, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a piece of A4 card. So 11 and 5 eighths of an inch by 8 and a quarter inches. And we're going to place that in landscape mode on our scoring board. And at this point, we're going to score at 11 and a quarter inches. Then we're going to turn the card anti-clockwise to portrait mode and along the whole length of the card, we're going to score at six and a half inches. And at that point, we can set our scoring board aside.
Now at this point I'm just going to position the card nice and squarely on my grid so that I've got this small section, that six and a half inch line closest to me. And I'm going to mark a point on the top edge of my card that is seven and a half inches along. So you could do this with the grid on your self heel mat, but um, it's whatever you're happy with. So I'm just going to mark it seven and a half inches in. And then on this six and a half inch line down here, I'm going to mark a point that is three and three quarter inches in. So those are just two little pencil marks there and here. Now at this point I can start to form some triangular shapes using those little pencil marks and I have actually swapped over to a pointed bone fold to give me a little bit more precision. You know, I always think that a knitting needle is the equivalent of this bone folder so hopefully you can find something that you can use. So I'm just going to start, I've got this small section down here which is actually the base of my box cover closest to me. So the largest space is above me and furthest away from me. And I'm just going to take that little mark that I made at the three and three quarter inch point and I'm going to draw a line from that mark and across from card edge to card edge from this top corner all the way across, just crossing through that line as well. Now I'm going to repeat that process from that seven and a half inch little mark that I made on this top edge, again dissecting through that little three and three quarter inch mark as well, and going from card edge to card edge, just working through it. And that's created one triangle in this section here, one large triangle. Now I'm going to just do one more and this time I'm going to go from that seven and a half inch point at the top of my card, but I'm going to be going to this little corner here. So you don't want the outside edge here, you're heading for this little corner where these fold, these score lines intersect, so the middle of that, and right to the edge of the card. Now, if you are in doubt, there is a diagram for this particular pattern piece included in that PDF document, so you have got something additional to refer to if you're in any doubt at all. So we'll just get that final line drawn in from card edge to card edge. Now the next thing that I need to be able to do is to fold and crease all these score lines. Now because that's fairly straightforward I'm going to do most of that off camera but I do just want to give you a little bit of a pointer do this one and show you what I mean. As you're folding and creasing, you will find that a lot of these lines will come together. So you can see how this line, once I folded this down, it's actually in line with this score line. So just look out for that and just make sure that the edges of card or fold lines on one piece of card are lining up with fold lines on another. You'll see where they need to be in line and that will just help to reassure you that you know your, your project is, is as square as it should be. So I'll finish that off off camera and come back to you at that point. Right, so now that all those folds have been creased, um, I'm going to need to reproduce the margin that I've got here so from this line to the edge of the card, I need to replicate that from this angular line to here. So I'm just going to draw in a point that is one and three quarters of an inch in from that score line. It doesn't have to be exact, you know, this bit is definitely, there's no need for it to be absolutely precise, but um, so I'm just marking out that one and three quarter inches roughly. And then I shall draw that line in. Now it may not come in exactly into this triangle tip, but don't worry, it doesn't really matter. It, as I say, it's not precise. Just draw a line. And that's going to give me a point at which I can trim off that excess card. So I'll just cut along that pencil line to remove the excess. So 
So with that done, I can now start to turn my attention to this end and I'm going to reproduce this sort of set of fold lines by simply folding this section up, just making sure that you've got the, these fold lines are lining up with the score lines. That's going to give you an idea that your um, shape is, your pattern piece is all nice and in line. And then I'm simply going to refold this line enough to transfer a line onto this lower flap section. So I hope you can see that's all I've done. And I've got this sort of crease line going on now here. I can now fold that line. And again, you make sure, I'll show you in a minute, I'll just crease this. I'll fold it back and crease it back the other way because it's easier. So again, when you're, when you're doing that creasing, just make sure that all these lines are lining up so that with the baseline and this angle line here and, and you'll be on target. So at that point, this piece of card here is excess. We don't need it. So we can simply cut that away and get rid of it. Just take my scissors and cut along the fold line. Okay, so the next thing that I want to do is to create a fixing tab for my pattern piece and that's going to occur along this edge of this particular score line here and that's just going to need to be in the region of three eighths of an inch wide just to give you enough of an area for your glue when you come to join the pattern pieces together. So I'm simply using that score line as my base and just measuring out three eighths of an inch markers from that score line. Now, this doesn't have to be entirely accurate. You know, this is inside the box. It's just providing you with a gluing area. So I'm just going to use those markers to give me a relatively even tab section. And so you're drawing a line from card edge to card edge once again. And at that point, we can take our scissors because this card here is excess card. So we can just cut along that pencil line that we just created to remove that card that we don't want. Now, the last thing that we need to do to complete this pattern piece is just to remove these two triangles so that incomplete this a rhombus shaped piece of card in the corner. Now, I am going to cut away the fold lines in this instance so that they don't interfere with the build process. And I'm just going to cut away that section of card there. And you at this stage, you should now find that this pattern piece is the equivalent of your diagram on that PDF document. Now you do need two of these pattern pieces exactly the same. So I shall repeat that process and create a second pattern piece off camera to save time and then I'll come back to you. Right, so I've now got two pattern pieces that are exactly the same. I hope that you can see that. So the next thing that I need to do is to be able to join these together to form one large pattern piece for my main box cover. Now, it can be a bit confusing, but what you're actually looking for, this is the best way that I found to do it, is you want to be starting to form a hexagon with these equilateral triangles. So if I just bring this down here, definitely I would suggest you do a dry run. And what you're actually aiming for, I'm hoping that you can see, this is starting to form a hexagon on the inside and another two equilateral triangles would complete that here. So if you've got that scenario, you're on track. And then you've got all these flaps on the outside of your pattern piece. So that's the first thing to look out for. Now the next thing, when you, when you join these together, you're really just pushing this raw edge up against the fold line, a small this this fold line on this this pattern piece here creates a little ridge. So if you push up against it, you're going to get a nice fit there. The other thing that you're looking out for is that this score line or fold line and this one form a continual straight line. So as long as you attend to all of those things, 
you will get a good join. So don't worry too much about this end. You know, if they're not exactly coming together, it, it, that's of least importance. It's the other things that you want to be looking out for. And certainly you want this straight line going through here. So having ascertained that on my dry run, I'm now just going to use a little bit of PVA glue to join that together. So I'm, but and what I'm going to do is I'll just save too much mess and to be assured of a complete join, I'm going to apply glue to the edge here, but I'm also going to apply glue along this edge as well. So by doing it on both edges, I should actually get a complete coverage along that tab without you know, having too much glue oozing out all over the place. And that's particularly for those of you who don't want to be um, painting your project. And you've got no, you know, you've got to keep things neat and tidy because there's no room for error, really. So, I, you know, I think that double join aspect works quite well. It doesn't matter on the inside of the box, but you certainly want to keep it nice and neat on the outside. So I just slide that into position, use that bridge, gently apply pressure. Just checking that that's all sorted, which it is. Then at that point, when I'm happy with the position of it, I can come to the inside and just apply that pressure on the inside and get rid of any excess glue. Right, so the next thing that we need to do, having sorted out that join, is to apply some extra card to these flaps here because they're actually missing a bit. Unfortunately, by using the A4 card, it did mean that we had an incomplete shape here. What we actually want is this shape here. If I just show you the main box cover, hopefully you can get a better idea. You can see that this line here is the line that we're dealing with where we're missing a piece of card and the magnets you can see visibly here are positioned in an area where there's no card to hold them in place. So we're just going to apply some card at this point just so that we have what's necessary to hold those magnets in place and also to provide an equal amount of strength across this section. So at this point, I'm going to start using a component which I've labeled up on that cutting list as a main cover flap finishing strip. So it's one and three quarter inches deep and it's over length. Now the first thing that we're going to do is get the angle right on one end. So we're going to take one of these flaps which is symmetrical in shape. So that's the shape we're aiming for. And we're just going to place this strip on the fold line so that it's in the corner of that flap and fold that flap over. And at this point, we can draw in a line to reproduce that angle onto our cover flap component. So at that point, we're just going to cut away that pencil line just to get rid of the excess card. We can now turn our attention to our flap that lacks that extra piece of card. And we can place our component that we've just added that angle into, again, onto that fold line and just fold that flap up so that the angle is where we need it to be. Now, when you're doing this, do make sure that it, if anything, it wants to be slightly in from this raw edge or from any fold lines because you don't want um, this component to interfere with the fold lines later on. I, I will show you that again. So at this point, having positioned that where you feel you need it to be, so it's not going to interfere with any of the construction process, we can add in the line on the other side in the same way. Just make sure it's in position. So at that point, we can once again use that line as a basis for cutting away excess card and I would err on the side of cutting away a little extra so it's not interfering with fold lines. 
So if we then put that back in position, I can just show you that you what you don't want, you've got to bring these folds together. So do just check before you glue that in place that when these two flaps are in place, you are not going to inhibit that fold from taking place and then you'll be fine. So at this point, I can now apply glue to all of this area here. You've seen me do that with large areas of PVA glue. I'm just using my PVA glue again. So I will just apply glue to that area there and stick that component in place there so that I've got this complete flap shape. Now don't worry too much if there's a discrepancy in the top edge here, it doesn't really matter. It's just as long as we've got enough of an area for covering that magnet there. So I shall do that off camera and I will do the same thing for this flap here and I'll come back to you at that point. Okay, so now that job's done and I hope you can see we've now got our flaps are looking all the same when we drop them down. So that's what you're aiming for. And at this point, that's all we can do with this main box cover just now. We don't want to be joining it at this stage because we need access to the inside of this cover later. So for the time being, we're just going to set it to one side. Now at this point, we're going to be turning our attention back to our base and we're going to be doing working on this base flap here that's going to form part of our closing flap. Now for that, we're going to use a piece of A5 card and we're going to place it in portrait mode on our scoring board and we're going to score at two and four inches. We're then going to turn this piece of card clockwise and we're just going to be scoring down to that very first intersecting line and we're going to score at three eighths of an inch and at seven and seven eighths of an inch. And at this point we can get rid of our scoring board. Now the first thing that we're going to do is just remove these little tiny narrow corners here and I am going to leave that fold line or score line intact for the time being. So I'm just going to take out the card either side of that score line and I'm going to do that on both ends of this pattern piece. And again you have got a diagram in that PDF document that, that shows you what you're aiming for, so in an illustration format. So that's there to help you as well. Now at this point we can just quickly fold and crease those score lines. And we now need to bring in that base that we have left drying earlier. And this is where those pencil lines are going to come into play. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this piece of card and set it on the base peak component that we made so that these little edges are flush with the edge. Now they, if you've cut away some of that score line, you may find that they don't quite span the whole seven and a half inches. Don't worry, just place them essentially as you can. So that's just effectively folding over the edge there, but it's abutting the edge of that smaller internal square. That's where we need it to be. And what we're going to do is we're going to mark a point where the corner of this little square is in line with this component here. So there's the corner of my square. So I'm just going to mark a line there on the edge. So I've now got a little pencil mark here and one here. So I can put my base to one side because that, that job is done for the moment and I'm just going to draw a line from this corner to my pencil line. So let's get that sorted. And that's giving me an area of excess card here that I don't want so I can cut that away. So I just need to then repeat that to the other side to gain a centralized angle flap. So I'll do the other side of camera and come back to you at that point. So having done that, so we've got these two angles going on, we can now use our little triangular template for the first time. And what we're going to do on that, on that line 
where we've just created these angles, so where we've got the angle flats, we're just going to take one side of our template, it doesn't matter which, because they're equal sided, it's an equal actual triangle, and we're going to position that, one of the edge of that centrally along that fold line. So, and at that point, we're going to transfer the angles of that triangle into that central panel only, just using a pencil line. So I've done that on both sides, as you can see here. So it's just that angled line there. Now at this point, we can take a ruler and we want to create a rectangular line here at, at right angles. It needs to be from that point at the end of that angled line we've just created, at right angles to the score line and this edge line. So I'm just keeping my ruler, the straight edge of my ruler, on, this, on the raw edge of that card. And I'm just drawing a line down to there. So we've now got this sort of shape going on. Now at this point I'm going to cut away this square of card. So I'll just very quickly do that. Use my bigger scissors. So just cut down that line. Into there. And then I can cut along the fold line now. I can see what I'm doing on this side. And that, this now needs repeating to the other side from this pencil line and cutting away this corner. So I'll do that off camera and come back to you. Right, so now that we've got this symmetrical shape in place, we can turn our attention back to this angled line that we drew in with a pencil. And what we're going to do is we're going to score that line from this corner point here, right the way along over this fold line to this edge of the card here. So let's just do that and then I can show you. Right, so I hope you can see that has actually gone straight over this line here to this edge. So it's not gone into this corner at all. It's, it's part way up on this angle here. And at this point we can fold and crease that line. Now what we want to do is just make that fit. So if we leave that in place, fold this flap down, we don't want any bulk of card here when we've got our closing flap finished. So we need to make sure they join nicely together. So we're just going to bring a pencil line along the edge of that flap to the corner. Let me bring that up for you. So it's all the way along the edge right to this corner point. So once we've got that in place, we can open this flap up and we're then going to extend this line. I'll do it before I show you. There, I'm going to there. So I'm then taking another pencil line from the corner into this corner. So again, it's where those two fold lines intersect, so into that centerpiece there. And that gives us a nice um, shape there. This card here and here is excess and also a tiny little bit there. So I'm going to cut all of that away. I'll show you. So we'll cut along that fold line there into that corner. I think that diagram will help to uh, clarify things for you. So do refer to that. Awkward, that one. Okay, so I just want to just show you how you've got this little sort of dog leg thing going on there. So you're looking out for that. Now what that means is that when we come to cover our strengthening section in there, this is going to fit very nicely, as you can see, side by side without any overlap of card. So I now need to do the same to this end and at this point, that or at that point rather, I will come back to you again. Right, so that's the closing flap pattern piece now absolutely finished. And you can see 
how this is how it will be ending up going together so that's the sort of thing that you're looking for now you do actually require four of these pattern pieces exactly the same but just as a tip rather than going through that whole process for all for another three times you can use this particular pattern piece as your template so all you need to do is take the piece of A5 card as you did initially with this one and score it at the two and the four inch mark and then just simply use this section here, lay your pattern piece on the top, just checking all the fold lines. You can draw all the way around the outside, cut it out, and then you can score in the remaining lines here. And that's going to be a much quicker process for you to end up with four pattern pieces exactly the same. So I'm going to do that off camera and then I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so now that we've got four closing flap patterns ready to go, we can now turn our attention to our closing flap packer. Now the packer is simply going to provide some space for our magnets, as you'll see in a bit, and that's going to ensure that they're not going to be visible on the decorative side of our box. Now the piece of card that we're going to use for our packer is eight and a quarter inches in length, which is over length and one and seven eighths of an inch from front to back here. And the first thing that we need to do is to create the appropriate angle on this section of card. And this is where our little triangular template comes back into play again. So we're simply going to rest the, the packer component in line with the base of what, or one of the sides of our equilateral triangle so that we've got it close to the corner here. And then we're simply going to trace the edge of that template onto our packer section, which is going to give us the angle that we need. And we can now cut away that excess card. So all we need to do now is find out where this other angle, this end, needs to be. Now I would just say that you, you can leave a reasonable amount of space around this packer section. You don't want it tight into the fold because you can see as soon as I start to try and fold that over, if it's really tight, you're getting this buckling in the middle. So you're better just leaving, you know, even a two mil space, just spacing it away. And then just making a mark at this end with an equal space away. So I think you can hopefully see that I am spacing it a reasonable distance away from that fold line. So I'm just making a mark at the top there. At that point, I can do exactly the same as I've done previously with my triangular template. And in this instance, still lining everything up with the base here, so I'm getting my correct angle, just making sure that this edge now is on that pencil line and I can draw a line down. So let's just do that. So that's giving me the other position for my angle and I can simply cut away that card. And then just double check the fit and I hope you can see there's quite a, a reasonable amount of space around there. And that just means when these little flaps are glued in, into place, there's, you know, everything's going to sit nice and flat. It's just providing the strength that we need. So what I'll do is I, I need to do that with all of our four closing flaps. So I'll sort out the other three and come back to you at that point. Right, so the next thing that we need to do is to make some provision for our magnets. And I'm just going to be using these little eight millimeter in diameter magnets and they're actually one millimeter thick. So they are quite slender, but it's still advisable to provide some recessing for these so that the bulk of them is not going to be evident on the decorative side of our box. Now, as we've learned from the Chicago screw heads, in order to recess the magnets, we need to create some holes. So it's just a similar process here. But the first thing that we need to do is to ascertain the position for those holes. So, you know, there is a diagram in that PDF document which will help you with that. Um, but if you were to work that out yourself, tidying up these folds here, if you fold everything in position, this is actually the flap that is going against the side of the box. So the magnet position needs to be 
ideally somewhere in these corners here and they will then clamp themselves onto the side of the box. Obviously we don't want them to be visible on the decorative side so the first sort of holes we're going to create are going to be on the inside and it's going to be on this flap here. Now the only other thing I want to draw your attention to is the fact that we need to consider this base flap for our main box cover. You can see here I hope that the magnets are positioned quite near the top and therefore you know in order to cover them with this flap of card the, the holes for those magnets need to be positioned at least one eighth of an inch down from this fold line here so that's just something for you to be aware of. Now there is one other thing that I consider to be quite critical when you're approaching this task and I, once I've shown you the approach that I take I will explain why that is. So the first thing that I do is I'll, I take a scrap piece of card that's got this right angle edge to it and I use that to decide where I want my hole to be positioned. So I know it's going to be over one eighth of an inch down from the top so my the, the, the flaps on my box cover will cover the magnet, the, the partnering magnet and once I've sorted that out I then punch my hole in my scrap piece of card where I want that to be as is the case here. Now because my magnets are 8 millimeters in diameter I'm actually using my 9 millimeter hole punch so that my magnet will nicely fit inside the hole. If you're going to use a larger hole it doesn't really matter as long as once you've ascertained the hole that you use you want to duplicate it as, as closely as possible. So having got that template, I can now use that on my flap. So let's just do this. And I, if I put this flat on the surface, I can just tell you, you know, what I'm doing. So I'm lining up the edge of my template with the edge of this card here, making sure that's in line. And I'm also pushing the template up against the ridge that is formed by this fold line. So again, I know where that position is going to be. I'm, I can then draw a circle which indicates it's just a double check for where my hole punch needs to settle in. Now I can then, having done it that way, and you might notice that I've put a little arrow on my template to indicate the top of the template. So if I now fold that over, I, I've also put top on again there just as a double reassurance. I can line that up the other side and I'm going to end up with this distance from here to here being the same as the distance from here to here and obviously the top section is naturally going to fall in line. So I can then draw another whole circle using that hole really by lining everything up and that means that I've got that nice symmetry going on and I can still use this as a basis for um, positioning my punch when I come to punch those holes. So that will settle in there, but you know that pencil mark is just a double security for that. So at that point I can punch my holes. Just to save time, I've got one here where the holes have already been punched and you can probably see that they're lining up in exactly the same position for those for the other flap that I've, I've prepared for the holes again. So we'll just get rid of that template for the time being. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to place our packer section inside this flap and we're going to make sure that everything folds neatly in place. Draw those circles around the existing holes and then we know where to punch the holes on that packer section as well. So that job needs to be done next. Now I will get all my closing flaps to this phase so that I've got all the holes um, punched that are necessary for my magnets. But before I go off camera to do that, I do just want to show you why it is really important to position those magnets in the same place on all four of your closing flaps. So if we take a look at our box, any elevation looks exactly the same. And if we take our cover off, then again, there's no indication which side belongs to which flap. 
And that means that if the magnets aren't positioned in the same place on the cover and the same place on each of the flaps, then they simply won't make a connection. So if I move this up here slightly just to demonstrate and I pull that flap up, you can see it's not making a connection because the magnets are not aligning. So just by bringing that back into its position, they make that connection. So I hope that sort of clarifies why it is so important to make sure that wherever you decide to place your magnets on these flaps, they must be the same for each of the flaps. Otherwise, you're going to have to keep turning around your box cover to find out which flap goes with which side and you want to avoid that if possible. Right, so with that sorted, I'll go off camera, sort out those flaps and come back to you at that stage. Right, so now that we've got all those holes in position, both on our closing flap and on our packer section, we can start to construct this clo closing flap. And the first thing that I'm going to do, this is the way, the approach that I take, make, just double check that everything's lining up in case you've, you know, switched your, flipped your um, packer over. It may be slightly different if you've done that. So just make sure that everything is lining up and not interfering with any of the fold lines before you start to glue. Then you're just going to apply some glue. I'll do this off camera because you understand what that's all about. So I'll just cover this rectangular section here with glue and then I can line up the holes on my packer. And once they're in place, just make sure before the glue has gone off too much that everything's positioned all right and apply some pressure with my bone folder and allow that to go off. Now in the interest of time, I've already got one to that stage. So you can see that this packer is now attached to that rectangular flap. So the next thing that you'll be doing is to apply glue to this section here and glue down that packer onto the inside of your closing flap. And at that stage, you can also apply glue to these little triangular flaps and glue both of those in place. So that's what I'm going to do off camera. I'll get all four of my closing flaps to that position and then I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so my closing flaps, all four of them are now at this stage so they're all glued down. Now the next thing that we need to do is, well, we've got two things that we need to do. A, we need to put in our magnets and then we need to neaten off the surface of this. So cover those magnets with a piece of card just so that we neaten everything off. Now because the glue that I'm using for my magnets is going to take a little time to dry, I'm going to fit the finishing strip on this component before I glue my magnets in place. Now the component that we're using for that neatening section is actually listed on those instructions as a closing flap finishing strip and it's eight and a quarter inches long by two inches front to back here. Now the first thing I do when, when I'm sorting this out and I have already trimmed the slightest slither from one of these edges and the reason for that is because when I fitted this card inside, on the inside where it needs to be positioned and then folded that. You do need to fold this into the approximate angle that it's going to be folded in when it's forming the side of the triangular box because you, the card, the further this is pushed in this direction, the more this piece of card is going to protrude. And what you don't want is for it to be visible on the decorative side of your box above this line on your closing flap. So if you do this and you, you, you fold that over and there's car, excess card showing here, just trim this strip back before you start to fit it. Now at this point, I'm simply going to use my pencil to fit this strip to my closing flap. And it's pretty much similar to what we've done before using our triangular template. So I'm just going to create that angle again, fold that down so you know that I've got the angle that I'm working with, and I'm just going to then draw that line in to create the angle that I need. And at that point, I can cut away that pencil line to create that angle and remove the excess card. At this point, I can simply reposition that 
in place and bearing in mind that whatever gap that I want to show on the actual clothing flap at the end of this neatening piece of card, I'm just going to slide the card back to double that gap so that it, it accounts for the same gap that I want at this end. So I can then turn that piece around and use the other end to find out where that mark lies. I can then do the same thing and just cut away the excess. Now, for me, I just double check that fit to make sure I'm happy with it in case I need to trim any more off. But as long as I'm happy with it, I'm now going to label this up because I am going to fit to each clothing flap. That's my choice. If you just want to use one as a template, then you know I'll leave that up to you. So I'm just going to mark that as one. And where that comes together, so whichever side is going to be facing onto that flap, I will also label that up as one. And then I know that those two belong together. So I will be repeating that process for the remaining three flaps. And as usual, in order to save time, I'll do that off camera and then come back to you. Right, so the next job that we're going to tackle is to put our magnets in place. And I do just want to go over that with you because if you're not familiar with magnets, this can cause you some problems. So I'm just going to talk to you about the magnets first. Now magnets are poled. And the best way for me to explain this is actually with an illustration. So I've got a little tube here of magnets that are actually fitted together. These are extremely strong, these little magnets. You know, they don't really want to come apart. So that's my tube of magnets and th those are the, the 16 magnets that I require for this project. Now I've also got some additional magnets here that are of the same size and make. Now if I want to join the two tubes together then they will come together very easily on the pole that applies to the two faces. If I take this with difficulty tube off and I flip this so that it's the opposite pole. If I try to bring those magnets together, there's a force that's forcing them apart. They're not going to come together. The only way I can get them to come together is to swap one or other of the tubes around so that the appropriate pole is in place and then they'll come together. Now, what that actually means is that you need to make sure that in every case here, you are putting the same pole down into these positions. And so the, the approach that I take, first of all, is to take a little bit of removable tape and place on one end of my tube of magnets. And that means that I will only ever take the magnets from the same end of my tube of magnets. So that's a starting point. So I, that's ready to go once I've got my glue in place. Now my current glue of choice for gluing magnets is Liquitex Gel Matte and because I want to do these all in one go I will just apply some glue into each of the areas that's going to take a magnet and I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so I hope you can see that I've applied a, a reasonable amount of glue into those areas because this is now going to have time to dry off and you know so it doesn't matter that there's a decent amount I'd rather that the magnets would hold in position now at this point I'm taking my little tube of magnets bearing in mind that I can identify one end now very easily so I'm only going to be taking off this end so it's a little bit of difficulty actually I'm just going to remove one magnet at a time and make sure that as I take that off I'm then having the same action each time to put that magnet down in place. And this is why I like to do them all in one go. So I know that the correct pole is going down where I need it to be. So I will continue on camera with this just to get them all in place.
So you do need to make sure that the same side is going down every time and then you'll be fine. So I can now just add some little bit of pressure and make sure that they are in place, which I'll do off camera and then I'll come back to you so that we can get on with the next phase. Now before I get rid of this closing flap, I did just want to make you aware that the order of approaching the remaining work to complete this box is very much dependent on whether you are going to be embellishing your box and the form that those embellishments take. So for example, if I wasn't going to be applying to any of the embellishments to this closing flap, so I was just going to leave it in the card color, then I've got my closing flap number four here and my closing flap fin finishing strip number four here. So I would simply apply my glue at this stage and glue that in place over the magnets and set it to one side to dry and that would finish that task. Now for this particular project, you can see that there's actually a paint finish on this finishing strip. And the likelihood is that if I try to paint that, apply that paint finish whilst it was stuck to the closing flap, I'm likely to get paint onto this gold edge and I really don't want to do that. So to get around that problem, I'm going to be applying my embellishments to this finishing strip before I actually apply it to the box. So that's why I'm setting aside the closing flaps for the time being for this particular project. Now, before we get started, I do just want to have a quick word on embellishments with regard to these closing flaps, just to help you with any decisions that you need to make for your own project. Now, if you're just applying a paint layer to these closing flaps, you'll probably be absolutely fine. But the first thing that you need to bear in mind is that these are going up against the flat edge of the box cover. So whatever embellishment you use on here does need to be relatively flat. Now, if you're building up thicker layers, thicker than a paint finish, it's probably advisable to just test the strength of your magnets. So, you know, I had a bit of a play around to see what I was going to do in terms of embellishment myself, as you can see here. So this is my sort of play sheet. Now, if we take this as being our closing fat finishing strip, so we know this is the last layer to go on in front of that magnet. So the magnet's going to be located behind there. So we can, we can put that scenario in place. So we've just got our magnets and we put it behind the thickest part of the embellishments that we've chosen. Now we know that that is then going up against the cover of our box. So we've got a layer of card before the partnering magnet. And at that point, if we put our magnet in place, we can test to see whether that's still going to hold. So if you've got any concerns at all, just run that experiment over the thickest part of whatever embellishment you're planning to use, and you can then move forward with confidence. Right, so in embellishing this particular project, I am going to be incorporating quite a lot of paint. And for that, I'm just simply using some emulsion paint that I happen to have around, and I'm coloring that up to a shade that I want with Artist's Acrylic Color. Now, in case you're interested in the specifics, this is actually um, Dulux Natural Hints Barley White. So it's a matte paint for walls and ceilings, and that's what I've used as my base. It's just because it was close to the color that I was looking for. Now to that, I have used these Winsor & Newton Finity Artist Acrylics color, specifically the yellow ochre. And I've simply added that to a small amount of that emulsion paint to achieve the color that I desire. And I'm, I have tried to mix enough to enable me to just do all this paint in one hit so I'm not going to end up with two slightly different shades. And in between applying color and allowing it to dry, I'll just put some cling film over the top here so that it retains its moisture. Now if we just quickly refer to the project so that we can see where this paint is going to be required, we can see it's going to be on these finishing strips that have been the latest part of the project that we've been tackling. I'm also going to need to apply some to the base as well. And actually, even on the closing flap itself, because this seam line down the closing flap 
I don't know whether you can see there, is actually in evidence between this finishing strip and the base itself. So I am going to also need to apply some paint in that area. So, you know, I've got those areas to, to consider. The other thing is I have got that paint on the pillars as well, and it is possible that I may have to mix up a separate batch for that, but actually it's farther in it's further enough away from the rest of the paint that you know a slight difference in colour is not going to matter too much. Now before I start with painting, one of the first things that I want to do is just sort out the base because actually the tray is going to be located in the centre of the base so I don't need to be painting the whole of this area. Now I know that I'm going to have a margin around the area of the painting of about one and three eighths of an inch. So I've just got a strip of card that's one and three eighths of an inch wide and I'm going to just put a pencil line down the side of there if I can find my pencil. There we are. So I'll just draw that line, just line everything up and just sort of not from end to end, it's just to, to give me an indication of where I can paint to. Just all the way around. So that's just giving me an idea. I hope you can just about make that out. So I will only paint this area here. I shan't bother with this area in the middle at all because that's going to be covered by my tray. So with that done, I can start turning my attention to the paint. Now, just for those of you who are not sure what approach to take with regard to painting, I will just show you the method that I like to use. It's entirely up to you, obviously, how you apply paint to your um, various components. So I tend to like to use a sponge and I don't like to use too much paint. So I know that this is the back because it's got my number on if you remember we referenced them earlier. So on the front of these sections I'm just going to use my sponge to apply a thin layer and I'm not even worried if I don't get full coverage the first time around. So I just keep putting a little bit of paint on the sponge until I've got a thin layer. And these will curl, unfortunately. It's because the moisture goes in, but you know, they'll glue down flat when we finish. So that's all I'm doing, and that is a very thin layer. You can see it's already starting to dry out. And I will apply that technique to wherever I require paint on the, the sort of larger flat areas. And I will apply as many layers as I need to achieve the color and coverage that's required. Now the only exception to the rule is this little closing flap here because it's going to be quite uh, difficult to be precise with a sponge. So I'm just going to use a little paintbrush and this will mean that I'm going to get a lot more paint on in one hit because it's going to go on more thickly. So I will get all the paint applied in the relevant spaces on these components using one or other of those methods and then I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so we've arrived at a new day today. By the time I put on all my layers of paint last night and allowed them to dry in between, I simply ran out of time. So we're back again this morning, and as you can see, I've just put a sample of each of those components out that required paint so that you can see the finished result. So the next thing that I'm going to do is just set the base and this finishing strip to one side and focus on the closing flap itself so that I can get that to its next phase. So we're now beginning to deal with the outside of the box. This is the closing flap and for this particular project this is going to be gold in colour. Now in order to achieve that I'm using a product called Liquid Leaf Metallic Paint and in this case I'm going to be using brass. Now before we start to use this product, I do just want to give you a little bit more information on it. It is a solvent based product, so it has that pungent smell that you would associate with a can of spray paint. And anything that you use to apply it with, so your brushes will need to be cleaned in something like white spirit. You're not going to get them clean in water. Now there are actually eight metallic colours in this range. 
And if you're like me and you buy off the internet, it is notoriously difficult with colour. And I actually ended up buying three pots of this product before I found the colour that I wanted. So I did think that as I can, I would give you that comparison of colour against a Ferrero Rocher wrapper, just in case you wouldn't necessarily have made the choice that I've made. And I hope you can see this colour clearly, but at least you've got something recognisable for comparison. So in actual fact, I first bought the classic gold and this has got, in my view, it's a lot more pink than the Ferrero Rocher. It's not too far off, but it is a bit pinky in my eye. Um, I then thought, well, maybe I needed something more yellowy or orangey. And I thought from the um, colors on the internet that Florentine would fit the bill, but actually, as you can see here, it's got a lot more copper tones, it's more orange in colour. Now, although the brass, which is what we're working with today, is not an exact match, I think it's probably somewhere, the colour of the wrapper is probably somewhere between classic and brass. It's a probably a combination of the two. But I decided that brass was a more close fit, and as I'm using that for my internal trays, and they're going to be quite close to the wrappers, that's the colour that I've gone for. So I hope that's quite useful for you if you're thinking of buying into this product. Right, so finally, I did just want to make you aware that this product does have good coverage. So it doesn't really matter whether you're applying it to a coloured card or to a white card, the same colour is coming through, so the product does cover very well. Now it may also be worth noting that you don't need much of this product. I've actually applied more here, and I hope you can see that it actually ended up creating this stained effect, which is certainly not what I would want on my project. Um, and also, if you do put more on, on a single layer of card, the I think it must be the solvent here, will seep through that card layer and stain the back of the card. So you may need to be aware of that for some of your own projects. So that's everything that I can give you on that particular product. Now this product does require mixing very well. So I'm going to go off camera, give this jar a thoroughly good shake, stir it up and then I'll come back to you and we can start to apply it. Right, so we're now ready to go. I've thoroughly shaken that jar and I've trimmed a kebab stick down with my secateurs because I find they make really good stirrers for small pots. So it's had a good stir as well. I'm just going to simply put a little bit on my brush. I'm using a brush in this instance and I'm just going to really spread that as much as I can along that component, getting to the edge. And if you, you know, I do want to put quite a thin layer on. If you feel that you've got any areas that you've missed and, you know, they're not quite dry, my feeling is don't go back over what you've done until you've allowed that paint to thoroughly dry out. Because in my experience, the risk is if you do that, you're going to get that staining that I showed you in that sample earlier. So, you know, I'm not... An expert on this product at all I'm not that familiar with it but um, that's the benefit of my experience anyway so you do really want to go into this edge here as well just slightly over because some of that may be visible from the bottom of the box and you know it's quite nice to get that continuity of color and the final bit that you're just going to do is around this edge here because you know that may um, that that may be visible depending on the size of your finishing strip. So just all the way along that edge. And this this product apparently is actually has ground up metal in it, and it's just suspended in a solvent. So you know if you put it on too thick, I'm guessing it's going to be quite granular. But you know, I'll leave you to play around with that. So that's all we're doing. So it's a, quite an interesting product, really. It gives a lovely result, I think. So um, I'll get all of my closing flaps to that stage, and then I'll come back to you. Right, so now that that job is done, we can set these to one side. We're not going to need that paint again for a little while. 
and we can turn our attention to some of the other embellishments. So the next task I'm going to tackle is stamping this border on my base. Now I've actually struggled with this, particularly where the corner stamp needs to join up with a strip of the same stamp pattern. So, you know, if you're much more familiar with stamping and you do a lot more of it than I do, it's quite likely that you will make a better job of this than I have done. So I'm not going to try and teach you how to do something that you're better at than I am already. What I will do is I'll share with you the products that I've used and just maybe include some hints and tips for those of you who are in the same boat as I am and wouldn't necessarily look out for those yourself. Okay, so this is the stamp set that I'm going to be using and I will put details of this in the description area for you, but it's a Dove Craft product and it's called Beautiful Borders. Now there are four different designs within this set and within each design you get three stamps. So you're getting a strip of the, the design, you get an angled corner and you get a curved corner. So it's quite useful really. Now I'm actually just using an angled corner in this particular design and a strip obviously in the same design. And I would say the problem that I had was there seemed to be little tolerance for me to line these up so that you got a seamless pattern. But they did do say that a bad workman blames his tools. So I don't want to be disparaging about this because I'm not a regular stamper so it's probably something that I'm doing wrong. Now having said that where there has been a problem for me I found a way of overcoming it as you will see later in the project. So that's the stamps covered. Now with regard to the ink that I'm using I had intended purchasing uh, fast drying pigment ink because I felt that it would probably be a better ink for a painted surface but I accidentally ended up buying fade resistant dye ink instead. And in this case, I'm using grape jelly and I just decided to stick with what I purchased. Now, I would really advise that you have a play around with whatever you're using and see how it works on your painted surface. I've sort of done that with a corner here. And what I found was I was looking for a more subtle contrast between my paint and my ink color. And I, I'm hoping that you can see that actually these particular inks are very bright. And this is that uh, grape jelly. So it does sort of match up with the label on the front. It's quite a bright finish and it wasn't something that I was looking for. So having played around, what I decided to do was to ink up my stamp, stamp it on a scrap piece of paper and then stamp it on my product. And that gave me a much more faded look which I've got here you can see that contrast perhaps and that was more in line with what I was looking for the other thing is that by taking off that excess ink I ended up with a much more detailed border because you know leaving the ink on meant that these little lines were a lot lot thicker once the stamp had been removed so play around, decide what look you're trying to achieve and you know get that on scrap pieces of paper before you go to your main project. That, that would certainly be my advice. Right, so just for those of you who aren't familiar with stamping at all and just need a starting point, I'm just simply going to be using a, an acrylic block which these clear stamps will stick to very easily. And I shall probably try and line it up with the grid on my block. So I'll line that pattern up with the grid on my block, which will hopefully help me to be able to line the um, joining strip up later. It'll give me a better chance, maybe. So at that point, I'll simply take my little ink pad and ink up my stamp And because that, I think that paint is not so absorbent, which is why I need to take the excess off. So I will just stamp it on a piece of scrap paper and then I will stamp it the second time on my project. And that's going to give me that slight little difference. And you can probably see here how that's a thicker line to that one, although it could be an optical illusion. So 
I hope that that is enough information for you to be going on with. I'm now going to have a bit of a practice session and then I will stamp around the edge of my base and hopefully get the corners and the strips to line up. So I will come back to you and show you that finished result. Okay, so that's that job now finished to the best of my ability. And I'm sure if you look closely enough, you will agree that there is plenty of scope for improvement. It's just a blessing that on this occasion, I am actually going for an aged and distressed look for my pyramid. So to a certain extent, I can get away with it. Now, with that job blissfully out of the way, I can now turn my attention to this exposed brickwork effect, which starts to bring us to the end of our embellishments. Now, um, I will be starting with the closing flap finishing strip components but before I put this base away I want to just point out that if any of you have experienced the same problems with stamping the border and you've got some of those joints that aren't meeting well or you've got heavy areas of ink that you're not happy with you you have got the opportunity with this brick effect to cover any of those areas up and I I've certainly done this in this area here because that's where that join would have occurred. So I've simply covered it up. So, you know, it's not the end of the world if you've struggled with that stamping to the same extent that I have. Now, the product that we're going to be using for that brick effect is actually intended for dolls' houses and it's called Realistic Brick Compound by Bromley Craft Products in this instance. Now I will put the details for that in the description area but the company that I got this from is UK based so you know if you're not based in the UK if you do a search on dolls house products you may find an equivalent. Now these, this company also sell a number of stencils and things that you know accompany this product so I'm also going to be using one of their stencils. Right, so I think the best thing to do to start with is to simply mix some of this product up. And I do find that it's better to have a flat surface, you know, even bigger than this if you can, because you're going to have more access to the product that way. If it's in a very deep, narrow thing, it's not quite so easy to pick it up. So that's just something I've found. I've just got a little bit of card in here. So I'll just put a little bit of the compound in here. Now you don't need too much and you can actually easily mix up another batch. So, you know, I tend to find that um, it's best to make less and just make another batch than, than make too much and waste it. Now all we're doing to that is adding some water until we get the consistency that we want. And I'm just using a water pen so I've got a little bit more control over how much water I am actually adding. And now on the instructions, they do say to make this quite wet, this paste. Um, but ooh, there's a lump in there, look. Take that out. Um, but I've actually found, and it could just be because I'm dealing with very small areas, I've actually found that it's better to have a drier paste. So, you know, I did play around and I always recommend that you, tr if you're coming into a new product that you're not familiar with, practice makes perfect. So it's always best just to have a bit of a play with some scrap card or something that does. it doesn't matter if it gets ruined. So that is a bit too dry I have to say. So we'll just put a little bit more water in there and I'm going to be careful how much water I add each time now because um, it can soon be too much. Right. Okay. So to my way of thinking, I hope you can get an idea of how that is. That's sort of got a sheen of moisture on it, but it's certainly not sloppy. It's sort of holding on my little tool there. So just that's what you're sort of aiming for. So the next thing that I want to do is actually decide where I'm going to put some bricks onto this little closing flat finishing strip. And you know, you can choose that at random. It's entirely up to you 
where you put those uh, finishing, where, where you put those that brickwork. So I can get an idea because this this particular stencil that I've bought has a mixture of large bricks and little bricks, so it gives me quite a lot of scope for varying things. So all I need to do is sort of gauge an idea and, and decide what I want in terms of the bricks. And then I'm going to take some of this stick and spray, and I'll do this off camera, just to apply it to the back of the stencil to make sure that all these little bits are held down in place so that none of the brick compound goes underneath. So I'll get that sorted and, and get that in place where I want to put some bricks and then I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so having made my decision where I want my brickwork to be, I firmly press down, having applied that mount adhesive or spray on adhesive, I firmly press down the stencil in that area so that all those little bits of the stencil are firmly stuck down. Now the other thing I've done, which I hope you can see, is wherever I want to use one of those brick spaces, I've just put a little pencil mark into that brick area so I know exactly what my plan is. I can see those marks. So at that point, we can start to apply our compound. And all I'm going to do there, I'm using this little spatula tool, but I, you know, as long as you've got something a little bit flexible, you should be all right. You know, even if there's a flexible spatula knife or something, you'll probably be fine. So in the first instance, I'm only going to try and use a downward motion in those areas rather than a spreading motion. And I'm not really worried if it's going on in a thick Sort of thicker than I, I need it or want it. So if I am using a dragging motion I'm being very gentle and making sure that it is only on the surface because I don't want it to drag underneath the areas of that stencil. So at this point in time I'm just going to put a little bit on and the first thing I'm doing is just going within those brick marks where I've got my little pencil crosses. And that's giving me my starting point. And as this goes down in a thin layer, so it's going to start to dry out. And at that point, it will start to work slightly differently. So, you know, it, it there's advantages in it being a little bit more wet when it starts to go down because the glues will absorb into the surface a little that way and you'll get a better adhesion but you know it does become easier to work in my view as it dries out just going to do this little bit and then the rest I will do off camera Right, so those are all the bricks that I decided on. And I've got, so I'm going to end up with some fairly straight line aspects down this side here, as you can see. But I'm thinking it might be quite nice to have some part bricks in some of these other areas, now that I can stand back and look at the shape. So in that instance, I'm just going to put a little bit more compound in and actually, you know, maybe even drag some of the excess compound that is evidently in place. So, and that's going to give me a little bit of variation. Now, at this point, I can start to drag and lift any excess off there just by gently scraping across the surface. It's less likely to go underneath the stencil now because, you know, there's the compound all around those little bits of plastic. I love doing this job actually. It fascinates me. So at this point, I tend to be one of these who believes fingers came first. I use my finger and I gently apply pressure 
onto that area just so I feel it gives it a better adhesion and it's downward mo motion so it's not going to cause any dragging under the stencil area at all. And with that job done, I can simply then lift the stencil and that's given me my brick effect. So I can now do that same thing wherever I want to have some exposed brickwork and then at that point I can come back to you. Right, so I am just about finished with all this brickwork layer now, but as I was working there were a couple of things that I remembered and I just want to make you aware of them because it may be useful for you. First of all, if you find as you're working that your compound is drying out and you know it's not moving very well in its space, then all, as long as you've got a very damp cloth, just put your tool into the back of that cloth so you've got a little bit of moisture it doesn't have to be much just a little bit of moisture on the back of your tool and that will add enough moisture onto that compound to help you smooth it out so that's one thing that might be useful now the other thing I'll just remove that to just to remind you you can certainly include the brickwork in the area where you expect the magnets to be in the corners. And in fact, I've done this on, on this example here. So, you know, it's not a problem. The only thing that I would say is if you have a tendency to put this brick layer on thick, you might want to just reconsider that in the areas where the magnets are. So just remember that those magnets have got to work through that layer. Now the other thing is where you put this brick compound is very much a personal thing. You know, you will know what looks right to you. But the only thing that I would say is it may be an idea, what I tend to do at least, is to do the design in conjunction with these little finishing strips as well. Because as in this case, I haven't got much in the way of brickwork here. So actually it's quite nice to include some on the finishing strip here because when the uh, box is open, all of these things will be visible. So, you know, it might just be an idea when you're placing your brickwork and deciding where to put it, you do it in conjunction with all the relevant components. So finally, um, the only other thing that you, you may have even thought about is the fact that at the moment we don't know exactly where that internal tray is going to be positioned. Now if you want to place some of your brickwork potentially right up against your tray, that's absolutely fine. I've actually used my 1 and 3 eighths margin that you may remember we used earlier and that's giving me an indication of how far that brickwork is going to come to and what I've done is I've deliberately included some brickwork here that I suspect is going to go underneath the tray because as long as we haven't varnished this brickwork we will be able to remove what we don't want and because that's going under the tray it's not really an issue. Now if the area that you're removing brickwork from is going to be visible and not hidden under that tray area you might just need to be aware that when the brickwork is removed it does leave this sort of milky residue and so if you don't want that sort of effect to be visible on your project then you really need to get your brickwork in place first time round so you're not having to remove any at a later date. Right, so that's really as far as I can go with this brickwork section. So I'm going to allow it time to dry out. Once I'm happy that, that that's the case, I can come back to you and we can move on. Right, so now that that brick compound has had time to dry off and it really doesn't take very long, I can start looking at adding some colour to provide some definition. Now there really is no right or wrong way to approach this. It's a creative process, you've got lots of options out there. So all I'm going to do is show you the products that I've used and how I've applied them. And that way, if you're really not sure how to proceed, it's going to give you a starting point. Now I've actually opted to use Tim Holtz Distress Inks. And in the first instance, I'm going to be using Scattered Straw. 
So all I'm going to do is just pop some onto some form of palette. In this case, it's just a white plate. And I am going to be applying this color uh, probably in a stronger tone than I would normally, uh, simply because I've become aware that when I apply my varnish layer, it does drain the color a little. So, um, you know, I, I make sure that it's stronger to start with. I will bring this closer to the camera for you once I've finished. So all I'm doing is I'm just colouring the, the surface of the brick itself. And I'm just wanting to add a sandy colour to that compound to give it perhaps a more appropriate colour for pyramids. So that's all I'm doing in the first instance, just getting on more or less a solid colour. Now, I don't need to really do too much of this on camera, so let's just bring that up so that you can get an idea. So I'm just adding colour. Now, I will continue to do that off camera to all the brick work that I've prepared for this project, and if that turns out once it's dry not to be quite as dark as I want it I may go over it a second time and at that point I'll come back and show you the result okay so I've now applied that scattered straw to all the brickwork that relates to this project including the base and I've just left a little bit as um, untouched so that you could perhaps make a comparison between the before and the after because I thought that might be useful for you. Now I did actually apply two layers of that distress ink because the first layer just wasn't a strong enough colour for my liking. Now the next thing that I'm going to do is to apply some varnish to this brick layer and that's going to do two things. It's going to seal that brick compound and seal that colour in but it's also going to provide some flexibility to the compound because it's actually quite brittle. Now the varnish that I'm actually using I have actually decanted it out of the tin because I find it does last better when it's in glass so I've, I've placed it in a glass jar. Now it's just an ordinary household product so it's run seal interior varnish, it's a matte clear finish and it's, it's quick drying so it's something that you'll find easily enough in any DIY store. Now I only want the varnish to go on the surface of my brick compound. I don't want it really to go into these gaps in between the brick shapes. Um, so I'm using a small brush and I'm just going to apply a little bit of varnish at a time. So, you know, I just work my way over the surface, being very careful. Now, we have already established that I have made do with products that I had available to me without having to go out and buy anything extra. And that has caused me some problems. The varnish that I've, I'm using here is a water-based varnish. And for those of you who are familiar with the distress inks, they react with water. And what that actually means is that as I apply this varnish, it, a reaction is going to go on that's somewhat unpredictable. That ink is potentially going to be drawn further into the compound with the varnish, so you're going to end up with a perhaps a paler finish on the surface. Also, the, any, any variety of colour that you may have felt looked nice is going to potentially disappear because it, the varnish is just going to take that ink and spread it out. Now, the, the advantage is that the ink will coat over the top of the varnish layer so detail can be added once this varnish is dry and that's what I shall be doing. The only reason I applied colour before varnish is because I, I just felt a bit easier about having the right base colour to be working with. So although it is a pain that it, it spreads everywhere and, and I'm not quite sure how it's going to react, I do feel that I'd rather have the base colour there to start with. 
So I shall just continue to carefully apply varnish just to the surface of these brick areas. And I will do that for all the project, all these little finishing strips, but not for my base. Now the reason why I don't want to apply varnish to this base section is because I'm not sure whether some of these brick areas are going to need to be trimmed back to allow for the fitting of the tray. And it's going to be much easier to just scrape away some of this brick compound if varnish hasn't been applied. So I will leave this as a completely uh, separate piece to apply the rest of the embellishments to. Right, so that's all my varnish applied now. And I have retained this piece for you so that you can see the various stages side by side. So this is our original brick compound uh, without any adjustment in color. This is where we've actually applied our distress ink. And you can see that there are some strong areas of color there. And then this section here has had varnish applied to and it's been allowed to dry out. And I'm hoping that you can see how that color has flattened out. Now the other thing, I don't want to push it too far, but I'm hoping also that you'll be able to see that this has actually added some flexibility to that brick compound, which is going to protect it, especially if it's in the area of those magnets. Now the next thing that I want to do is just to bring back some of that variation in that brickwork. So I'm simply going to go in with a much stronger mix of this scattered straw. So I'm, I haven't changed the color at all. And I'm simply going to, at random, select areas of the brick to apply a little extra color. So I've just caught the edge there. So it, you can go across the top of some bricks just to add that in there or you can add just to the middle or you can work from one corner and sort of spread it in it doesn't really matter it's just adding that variety of color that often is the result of when it's fired in the kiln that sort of thing it can produce different colors in the clay so that's all I'm doing so I, that's my next task. I'll get on with that. Um, but actually, before I do that, I will just show you. I did this one earlier so that you could see the finished result as well. So I'm hoping you know, that once it's dried out, you're going to get this nice depth, which is absent in this, this area here, which has simply had an application of varnish. So I will finish that task off and come back to you at that point. Right, so the last thing that we need to be doing before we return to constructing the box is to sort out our grout lines. And there is a decision for you to make here. Grout lines, it can vary in color. Some can be quite gray in color. Some can be paler than the brickwork and some can be darker. So you need to decide which way you're going to go. And in this instance, I've decided to go dark. Now I'm still using a Tim Holtz Distress Ink for that purpose and in this case it's actually brushed corduroy. Now we are often dealing with some very fine lines here so I'm using a very fine detail brush for this task but it's fairly straightforward and I'll just show you so that you can get started. I just start out probably using a paler colour to start with so not really dark and I'm just working in between these lines. Now, you don't have to do them all the way along if you don't want to. You know, if it's near one of these ends, you can keep it, the, it very pale. Um, you know, this is a matter of opinion, really. And just continue to do that. Now, there's just a few things that I'll point out to you. Now, where we've got these ends, I sometimes like, if there's square ends, not so much these torn ones, I tend to keep them clear, but where there's a square end and potentially there was a grout line, I will, or mortar line I suppose I should say, I do do a little bit of colour in some of those instances as well. So that's one thing. 
And once I've got all my first pale colour on and it's been allowed to dry, I'll then return and add another layer in places to darken it up. So I'm doing it in phases. And then very finally, I'll go into certain areas where I think maybe I want a little bit more definition and just add another layer just to bring out a little bit of interest and you know it's random there's no rhyme or reason particularly to it but it just starts to add as I say just a little bit more interest so on the whole it is just a case of having a bit of a play and seeing what you like I really think that's all I can tell you for that so that's the completed painted version of that brickwork. I'm going to get on and get it all finished to that stage for all these little closing flat strips. And then I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so now that that task is complete for the time being, we can retrieve our closing flap. And if you remember, we did number them up. So this is closing flap number one, and this is the finishing strip for the number one closing flap. And we can now simply apply some PVA glue and gently glue that in place. Now I, I will apply the glue and show you that uh, process on camera because we're dealing with something slightly delicate here and you might just like to see um, how that goes together. Right, so I have applied my PVA glue in the usual way and there is quite a lot on there, so I've been generous with it, but I don't want too much glue oozing everywhere. So I am just going to use a piece of kitchen towel to take off any excess at this point. So it will retain all the stickiness. It's just getting rid of anything that might otherwise ooze. So yeah, it's, it's got rid of quite a bit there. There we go. So at that point, I'm just going to line everything up on here and it will slide around a bit. Just make sure that the corners, nothing's overlapping. And just gently applying the pressure. This is quite a thick component now because of all the paint. So it's not too much of an issue. But I'm not using my bone folder. I'm just applying pressure all round and I can oh, probably actually not that damn kitchen roll but I can I can use a piece of kitchen roll a clean piece preferably and just apply that pressure over the top and just check all the edges to make sure that it's going down nicely so that's it you do need to just take a little bit of care but you know it goes down much in the same way as anything else. So I will get all of those fixed to my closing flaps and I can come back to you at that point. Right, so the next thing that we're able to do is to fit our closing flap to our base flap. And the first thing that I'm going to do in preparation for that is to take two of my magnets and just put them to one side where I can get hold of them easily. You will need to separate them, otherwise they're going to want to come together. Now the next thing I'm going to do is to bring in my main box cover. And I'm just going to dry fit it at that seam. Now, when I work with my closing flap, the first one that I do is not the one where the seam is coming together, because I'm right-handed, working anti-clockwise, I'm doing the next one around. So it's this one here, and that's going to allow me access inside the box at the point that I need it. And you'll identify with that in a moment. So what I need to do is make sure when I'm fitting that closing flap, that this main box cover is situated on the corners of that base where it needs to be located. And what I've recently found helps with that is to just take a little bit of removable tape and use that 
to hold that cover in position on the base on two sides of that main box cover. So it's the next one round from the one that you're working on and the one round after that. So just take a little bit of tape. Just making sure that the corners are positioned where they need to be and securing that cover in place. Now at this point, you can take your closing flap and you want to slide that underneath the base. So it wants, it probably now won't abut absolutely onto this little edge of this square, but you know, it's, it's going to be in that vicinity. So if you put that in a position and hold it up against the side of your cover, and you, what you're looking for is a centralized position. So you want to have the same amount of space on this side of the closing flap as you've got on that side. So once you're happy with that, we just set our box down, hold the, the main cover down so that that's not going to move. Just open up the box. You can reposition the box corner on this side where it needs to be. And then you just take one of your magnets raise the closing flap into place where it needs to be and we know that the magnets are located roughly in these positions here on our closing flap so all you're going to do now is to offer up this second magnet roughly in that vicinity and it should then start to find its location that snap was an indication that that magnet has snapped in place and you can probably now see that that closing flap is held in position. So I can now just take my other magnet and do the same thing on the far side here. And it will find its own pole. There we go. So that is now in position. So I can just double check that nothing's moved. And if I'm happy with that, I'm ready to glue my closing flap in place. So I am going to just close this back up again because it helps to create that stability for that flap and just reassures me that that positioning is right and then at this stage I'm simply going to draw a line you can see how it's shifted away from this box this little um, square edge but I'm going to draw a line in here around that flap which is going to provide me with the position for that flap and allow me to position it after I've glued it. So there we go. So at that stage all I'm going to do is to apply some glue to this area and then I'll be able to glue this flap down. Now the only pointer that I have for you is that although you do want glue up against the edge of this base section you don't want it on the this edge this face here so um, you know just be careful that the glue only goes on this surface and not over the edge otherwise you're going to get your closing flap gluing up in the wrong place so I'm going to glue that up off camera and then I'll come back to you at that point right so having glued that in place using those pencil lines as a guide and leaving all the magnets in place i've also double checked as that glue is setting up that the corners are retaining the position that i want and everything's positioned where it should be i can now turn my attention to dealing with the inside of the main box cover now i do need full access to the inside of this cover and with that in mind just to save a bit of time i've already removed that removable tape that we used as an aid earlier so all i'm going to do is open up the box cover and that's going to allow me to just lay everything flat we can see that our magnets are in position. They haven't moved. They're exactly where we need them to be. So all we need to do now is to glue down this flap over the top of the magnets. So I'm going to apply some glue off camera and then I can come back to you just to show you how you're dealing with the bulk of these magnets. Okay, so you can probably see I've applied my usual generous amount of glue 
and actually that glue is going to soak into that card and soften it a little, which is going to work in our favour when we're dealing with these magnet areas. So all I'm going to do now is just simply fold that over where that needs to be positioned and allow that glue to start to take a hold. And you know, the normal process with the burn folder applies. And then once that's sorted, where these magnets are, all you're going to do is apply some pressure. Put your finger on top of the magnets just to make sure it's not going to move anywhere. It shouldn't because it's being held in place by that closing flap on the other side. But you know, all you're doing is making sure that it's not going to move and just apply some pressure around it so that it's sealed in place, particularly along the top edge here, because you know that's going to hold it in place behind the card. So that's all you're doing. I'll, I'll continue to work that, so I can just work that around that magnet a little bit until that's gone down, and then I'll come back to you at that stage. Okay, so we're now just needing really to repeat that process for our remaining closing flaps and our main cover base flaps. Now we do need to do something just very slightly differently for this last flap where there's, we've got this raw edge seam going on and it's the one without the tab fixing. So I'll get everything to that stage and then I'll just come and show you the difference with regard to what you need to be doing at that point. Right, I've now reached my last flap on my main box cover and this is that one with that raw edge and this is where there is a slight difference that I wanted to draw your attention to. Now when we come to join the sides of our main box cover, this fixing tab here really wants to be positioned in between the actual decorative side of the cover and this flap. So in order to do that, when we glue this flap up, we want to leave an area without glue to allow that fixing tab to just be slotted in between it. So all I'm going to do here is to just take my ruler and draw a line approximately a half an inch away on that tab. And all I'm now going to do is glue the area again, being careful not to put too much at this end because what I don't want to do is when I apply pressure, I don't want glue to ooze into this area. So you need to keep the glue to just what you need here and no more. And then glue this flap down in the normal way. So, you know, I just needed you to know that. I will finish that off in that way off camera and come back to you when I've finished. Right, so that's all of my main box cover flaps finished and those magnets are nicely secured there. Also, all of these closing flaps are also in position. Now we're not quite ready to join the sides of our main box cover yet because we've got some embellishments to apply, these, these layered card embellishments, and it's going to be a lot easier for us to apply pressure to glue those in place if our main box cover component can be laid flat, as is the case here. Now what that means is that we can set this aside whilst we attend to our embellishments. But just as a tip, if you use PVA glue as I have done, it does actually take a little time to dry out. Um, and so I do find that at this point, whilst you're setting this aside, it's worth just forming your box with a, you know, obviously putting that seam in place on a temporary basis. And that means that as that glue dries out, so the box is going to hold the position that you want it to remain in. So I just like to form my box before I set it aside. So that's just a little something extra for you. Right, so the next thing that we're going to tackle is our main cover embellishment packet. And because the work involved is very similar to tasks we've already carried out, I'm going to be keeping information at a minimum here. So the first thing you need to do is to use that triangle template again, and you're lining up that embellishment packet, making sure everything is square. That's the most important thing, so that you keep that equilateral triangle going on. Now you're just using line one 
of your template and you're lining that line one along the bottom of this embellishment packer and then you're simply drawing around the tip and I've actually already done that for your information so I will show you up close in a minute. Now once you've got one triangle drawn you're going to need to glue these so that you've got a double thickness packer. The first triangle drawn you can use the angle of the side of that first triangle to replace your template again in the opposite direction still lining up line one but this time along the top of the component and draw along the remaining side. That's what you're going to end up with. This is excess that can be trimmed away. You can cut along the middle of these sections and glue these two triangles together to form your packer. Now at that point you will be left with this scenario. You'll have a long off cut of card, so that's the equivalent of what was left, and you'll have a double thickness triangle. So those two triangles are now glued together. Now that's dealt with the smallest of the two packer sections, and we're now going to deal with the larger of the two. So you're just going to repeat that process again, but this time you're going to line up line three with the bottom of your component and draw those triangles and then flip that over to the other side and line it up with the top and you'll end up with two sections that are the equivalent to that size there and you will be gluing those together to form a double thickness packer. Now at that point you're going to have this scenario, a double layer small packer a double layer large packer and a small off cut of card. Now you do, that's just scrap, so you don't need that at all. But you're going to need four sets like this. So you're just going to repeat that process until you've got those four sets. I'll do that off camera and then I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so now that we've got all our packers ready, we can look at covering them and I'm going to be starting with the smallest one first. So I'm starting with my cover component which is a piece of card that's two and seven eighths of an inch by two and a half inches in size. And I'm, I've positioned my packer on that piece of card so that the card is in portrait mode. So this is the longest edge, shortest width. And you're just spacing it centrally from left to right but you're just moving it down from that top edge equivalent to the thickness of your packer section and you know that's the correct position for it. At that point we're just simply going to draw or score around our packer shape. It doesn't have to be to the points but you know there we go. So that's that stage. We can now fold and crease all those score lines. I hope you can just about see them there. And we're going to extend them to the edges of the card. So right the way across. At this point we can replace our packer and I, I quite like, because there's a thickness to that shape, I do quite like to place it and then re-score those lines just to get that position or re-crease the lines perhaps I should say. So that's going to help hold it in the position where it needs to be. Now at this stage I want to just find that central position. So I'm going to use my uh, the straight edge of my ruler as a guide, just trying to keep everything square. And then I'll draw that line from the tip of that triangle down to the edge of that component. So we're just going from the tip down to there. And then we can cut away that excess card by removing the pencil line. Now at this stage we can replace our packer section and in this case we're going to refold 
the, the side of that component that we've just trimmed back over the top of the other side. And at that point, we can transfer that line by drawing down the edge. We're just transferring that line onto the card below. And that's giving us a new point to remove the excess card from. So we can now re replace it again, put those flaps down where they need to be, and we can raise up this base section. And again, I do quite like to give it a little bit of a crease just to reinforce its position. And we're just going to mark on the top edge of that card where that central line is. And then we can remove our packer section again. We can then draw in some lines and I'll show you where they're going to once I've drawn one in because it's going to be clearer. Right, so those have just gone in to the outside edge of where these score lines come together. So if it's on the inside edge, you're going to not have enough card to cover this component. So if you're unsure, move it a bit further out and then you can always trim it back again. So it's just from that point, central point we marked across to that edge there. And that then means that we can remove that excess card as well. Now at this point, we can replace our packer section again, place our little side flaps down, and then bring our base flap up to meet it. And just check that everything seems to be where it needs to be. And then at that point, we're going to transfer the lines from our base onto the side flaps. So just drawn along that base section to transfer those lines onto the side flaps. And that's going to deal with this excess card that really doesn't need to be there. So now we can trim that away as well. Again, you don't really want to go beyond this outside edge of these score lines. So, so if your pencil line isn't is on the inside cut to the outside so at this point you you then you're ending up with this sort of shape if i set that down you can perhaps see a little bit better and if we now put our packer inside that we will be able to cover our packer in the very same way that we covered our closing flap sections earlier in the project. So the first thing that I will do is glue the packer inside, then I'll glue the side flaps down and these. And sometimes whilst the glue is still wet, you can use your bone folder just to shape these corners because they can get a little bit spiky if you don't do that. And that will be your component finished. So I will get the other three to this stage and glued and then I'll come back to you and we'll look at the larger ones. So with those finished and sorted we can now turn our attention to our larger packer component and for that obviously we need a slightly larger piece of card and that's five and a half inches by four inches and that does need a score line to start us off We've, and I've done that off camera to save time. So it's just in portrait mode at one and one eighth of an inch. And then that line needs folding and creasing. Now at this point we can take our packer and I am going to take a slightly different stance with this packer. I'm showing you an alternative method which you can utilize both in this case and with that smaller embellishment. It's just um, 
a, a method that I now prefer to use that is actually varying from the method that's given in the PDF instruction document. So I'll leave you to decide which approach you take. So in the first instance, instead of just placing my packer here, as I did with a small embellishment, I'm going to apply some glue to the back and I'm going to glue it in place so it'll be centrally positioned and on that fold line. So I'll do that off camera so it has a little chance to, to dry out before we continue with that and then I'll come back to you at that point. Okay, so now that's glued in place and you, you may notice it's the shorter edge that is actually against that fold line. I'm just going to reinforce that crease all the way along that top edge and get it so that it's really quite a sharp crease. I can then score down the sides of the shape and draw them up and over the edge. And the advantage I find with this method is that nothing is now moving. You know, that's glued in place, it's not going anywhere. So, you know, you've got a lot better sort of scenario to work with in that respect. So we'll repeat that to this side. Just score that edge, draw that card up, fold it over the top and extend that crease from card edge to card edge. Now at this point, we can remove the excess card and I'm basically just cutting down these fold lines. If, if in doubt, leave the fold lines in place. You can always come back and trim away a little bit more. At this stage, I'm just going to fold this down. You can see that little spiky bit there perhaps, but I'm now going to mark where this corner is on this side flap there. So I've just got a little pencil mark there and I'm actually going to transfer that to the other side of the card so that I can see what I'm working with. So it's just there. And Bearing in mind that it's about the thickness, we need about the thickness of this component here away from the very corner of the component. So I'm just drawing a line from that pencil mark, leaving that sort of thickness and passing straight through to the other card edge. So it is only just and so away from that corner. That's the where the corner is. And then I can cut that away. So I'll do that, repeat it to the other side and come back to you at that point. Right, so at this point, I can put in my final score line, which is across the bottom of the, of the component. And I can fold that over and crease that as well. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to leave that in place and drop this top flap down. And we're just going to draw around any excess card. I'll show you in a minute. So it's just a question of drawing around where this is overlapping and that transfers that shape onto there and it gives us these corner positions. So what we're now going to do is take a line from each of those corner positions. Well, let me draw the line and then I can show you where it goes to. Right, so it's going from the corner position here, right to the where this fold line is, right into that corner there. And that's going to be the excess card. 
So if I repeat this to the other side, and then I can cut away that excess card. And that's just by cutting away all of those pencil lines. And that should then give us a nice fit, which we can now glue in place. So we'll glue all of those down. And this is one of those occasions where we're going to end up with a little spiky bit. I don't know whether you can just see that. So that will need to be tucked in and shaped around with the bone folder in the way that I showed you with the smaller component. So you need to have all four of those uh, packers covered in this way so I will get all of mine covered and glued down and then at that point I can come back to you. Right, so now that our embellishments are ready, we can apply them to our main box cover. So I've retrieved that from the box itself and it's laying flat here. Now I'm choosing a section uh, because I feel it's easy to illustrate where I, I can uh, get that even distance between two fold lines rather than dealing with an outside edge at this point. So all we're doing is we're taking our triangular template and we're positioning it so that the point of the template is at the point, topmost point of our pattern piece and it's positioned in line with all the score lines. Now the bottom of our little embellishment needs to be positioned on this line here. So it's about two and one eighths of an inch down from the top and that's actually line two on our template. So all I'm doing is I'm placing that on top of my ruler and making sure that my ruler is lining up underneath that line on my template. Now having established that, all I then need to do is to apply glue to the back of my embellishment place it centrally so that I can use my ruler line for the base and all I've got to do is make sure that I have an even margin on either side of the embellishment so that it's going to be placed centrally on the side of my box. So that's all there is to it. So I will glue that in place, repeat the process again for the other three remaining sides and then I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so having got all of those first set of embellishments nicely in place, this is the best way forward that I have found to fit these central ones. So the first thing you want to do is dry construct your box, bearing in mind that this seam still remains to be fitted. So once that's happened, all you want to do is just drop down three of the closing flaps to release this pattern piece and without allowing any of this the magnets to move here or the positioning to move just lay everything flat just move that way you can see it and then you'll just apply glue in the normal way and just choose your eye to position that centrally between the two existing components so, you know, that's the best method that I've found to date and that's what I'll be doing. So I will do, do that for all four sides of my pattern piece and then I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so with all those embellishments now applied, there's no longer any need for us to retain this pattern piece in a flat format. So we can start to look at joining the sides of our box together. Now I am just going to do that as a dry run and slide this little tab. I need a little bit of a hand there. Just slide that in position in between this cover section and this flap section where we left that bit of glue missing. So the first thing that I'm going to do on the inside here, at the top edge of this flap, I'm just going to make a mark and actually probably draw around the side of there a bit as well. 
Now what that's going to do is it's going to uh, give me an indication of where I need to also apply glue on this side of this fixing tab. So this will go on the inside here. So I need to apply glue all the way along this section, but also on this section. So let's, let's just give that a go. I don't really want to have too much excess glue at this stage. So, you know, I will try and not to have too much oozing going on. So at this stage, just applying a thin layer of glue that will hopefully just go a little bit tacky. I'm going to use that double method. So I'm going to also put a little tiny bit along here, but I only want to extend it to this point here. So just take off all that excess. I don't want it to ooze. And then I'll also apply some in this area here where I've got that pencil mark. And I know there's going to be that overlap. And that means it's going to be providing stickiness on both sides of that tab in that location. So at this point, I can just ease that in between those two sections where it needs to go. Just push it right home. And then I can start to apply pressure along that seam and just make sure that I'm happy with that position. And then I can also turn it to the inside. I hope you can see that there. And just apply some pressure on the inside as well. Just being mindful of those embellishments on the other side. And then just give that a moment to dry out before we start looking at the stabilizer. So I'll come back to you at that stage. Right, so now that that seam has had time to dry off and I'm absolutely sure that it's not um, coming away in any areas, I can show you the problem with this box component as it stands. And, and this is it, there's no stability. This is very floppy, it will almost go flat in, in certainly along one um, of its axes. So, you know, we need to address that. And in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to make a tiny little pyramid section and that's going to slot right in the top of this point here and that will then make this component rigid. So in order to do that, we're going to need to start out with a hexagon shape. Now this hexagon actually has one and a half inch sides. And if you haven't got a die cutter that will easily give you a hexagon of this size, I have included a template for you in that PDF document. So as long as you print that page out at 100%, you can use that hexagon there and it will be the appropriate size for this project. Now the first thing that we're going to be doing is to score lines from these extreme points to keep dissecting the hexagon in half. So I'll just do that. Now there is a diagram um, within that PDF document to help you with this process, just in case uh, you need that little bit of extra guidance. So you're doing this three times in total to dissect the hexagon into six equal actual triangles. Now at this point, I'm going to need my scoring board. So I will set that up for you and then come back at that point. So the next thing that we want to do is to create a smaller hexagon in the center of this larger one. And that means that we need to create a score line that is five eighths of an inch away from this line 
that's five eighths of an inch, but it's only going to be drawn between these angled lines. So I don't know whether you can see this example here. This is that angled line and it, I've just scored a line to the next angled line. So in order to do that, I'm just placing that on my scoreboard and just having a check to see where these points are lining up on a, on a grid line. And then I'm lightly taking a line and so that I can feel that groove. And then when it gets to the point where there's a, those two diagonal lines, I'm then forming that score line. So just keep doing that on each side of this shape at the five eighths of an inch mark until you've got a small hexagon shape in the middle. So I'll continue to do that off camera and then come back to you when I'm finished. Right, so I'm hoping that you can see that I've got this little hexagon now in the center of the large one. And I've also drawn in a line that extends from one of the corners of that hexagon to the outside of the larger hexagon so that the line is actually forming a right angle at this point here. So I need to continue to do that. So if I just show you how I'm achieving that. So I'm simply lining up my ruler. Let's bring this up to you lining up my ruler with the square edge of this hexagon shape so that it's lining up with one of the points on my smaller hexagon and then drawing that line. And I need to continue doing that 12 times in total because if I show you the diagram, you actually need to have that line drawn on either side. So it's this dotted orange line that we're actually working on at the moment. And you can see that it's forming this kite shape in the corners of the large hexagon and that's happening in every single instance. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll carry on and get those lines in place off camera and I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so now that we've got all those little lines in place, we can fold and crease the original set of score lines that spanned across the widest point of our hexagonal shape. So we've just got three of those to do. And that's basically folding that hexagon in half. Three times, that one, that one, one more. Now at this point, I'm going to use one of those lines and I'm just going to cut up the middle of the fold line into the center of the hexagonal shape. So that's the starting point. The next thing I'm going to do is remove, just cut along those little pencil lines in each case to remove that kite shape in the corner. So I've got to do that to all of the little kite shape. So I'll get on and do that off camera and come back to you when that's finished. Right, so with that achieved, we've now got this sort of flower shaped pattern going on. So that's what your pattern piece should look like at this stage. Now when we form our pyramid shape, we're just going to simply overlap so that we end up with four sides rather than six. But what, whilst we're going to retain the six triangular sections, we only need to have four fixing flaps. So I'm simply going to cut along this line at the bottom here, or remove it actually altogether so it's not going to interfere, in order to remove two of those flaps that we don't want. So I'll go into that corner. Now at this stage, I am going to fold that over and just make sure that that crease is in place a little because that way I can tuck it out of the way as I form the shape. And I'm going to just apply glue to these two areas here that don't have a fixing flap, just on the decorative side, so the outside in this case. Now, 
I can then, I'm not going to glue them both at the same time. I actually find it's easier to just do the first one and get this shape right first. So just glue down that one edge and leave the other one on the inside without making contact. And then once you're happy that your shape is correct, use your bone folder in the normal way just to apply that pressure. Make sure it's taken. Now that glue is moist enough that actually once that's sorted we can now lay this down and, and it will still stick. So that again apply pressure there and by leaving those um, sections in place and creating a double layer it's just making it stronger you know there's no need to get rid of it if it's just going to be waste and it's going to help us to make a stronger shape. Now at this point all we're going to need to do is apply glue to these flaps and glue them in place that way and I tend to work with opposites and then simply glue them down that way until you've got a little tiny pyramid going on. So I will get that to that stage and then come back to you at that point. Right so now that my little pyramid is ready to go I do like to have my base ready and I'll explain why in a moment and now I've got my cover here what I'm going to do first of all is to put some glue in the bottom there that's going to be in the vicinity of the tip of this little pyramid and I'm now going to put some glue on the sides of the pyramid as well a bit of a messy job this one. I just want to, to have something that's going to provide that bond inside my box. So at that point, make sure my hands are clean, turn my cover upside down and just really drop that pyramid shape, that mini pyramid in place and just apply some pressure so that that glue has a chance to take a bit of a hold. Really press it down. And that can take a little while, so I'm going to sort of rush it here for the sake of time, but it'll give you an idea. You can spend a bit longer than I have done. So the glue is starting to ooze in places, so I know that that's got a reasonable hold. And then at that point, I do want to put it back onto my base and get all the sides in place, just in case the proportions of that are going to push this out. Whether that would happen, I don't know, but I've never risked it. So once you're happy with the position of that little pyramid that's going to give some rigidity to this main box cover, just put it back on its base and let it dry completely in that position. So I will do that. Um, Put that to one side and that means that we can move on to our trays. Now in view of the fact that this project has ended up being longer than I first anticipated, I really feel that I don't have any choice but to split it into two parts. So the internal trays and the general finishing off will be covered in part two and I will put a link to that in the description area for you in case it doesn't just simply pop up. In case of difficulty, all of my videos can be fairly easily found on my website at griffinart.co.uk. So that option's there for you too. So thank you very much for sticking with me so far. If you are intending to complete this project, hopefully we can get together again in part two.